I think I'm live here. Can folks see me and hear me? Let's see. If you can hear and see me, let me know in the comments. I did one live thing a few years ago or a year ago, and so this is still a little new to me, maybe working out the kinks. Ben can hear me. Can you folks see me? Because if so, I can get started. Be happy to do so. Hey, all right. Cool. Well, this is wonderful to have you all here. Whoa, lots of comments coming in really quickly. I'm going to have to figure out how to navigate that. Um, First of all, I want to say thank you for joining me this evening. Sasha may pop over and share some notes and ideas uh, during this time. I don't know that I have a real formal plan set up on how to do this, but just wanted to offer up the idea of uh, a space where if folks have questions about how we are running our chicken composting operation, um, and maybe you've got some issues with what you're trying to do. That's the idea with this time. And I don't have a formal amount of space for this either. Maybe half hour, maybe an hour. We'll see how it goes. Um, and I see a lot of familiar names in here. So that's really exciting. Thank you so much all for being part of this community. Um, yeah, let's see. So... How do we do this? Do you want to folks folks start asking some questions and we'll see how it goes? Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Well, the first question I'm seeing, and I might have missed some questions from earlier on, but the first one I'm seeing is, uh, can you explain more on when, how many, and how you harvest chickens from your system? Um, probably won't go too, too deeply into the process on how we harvest our hens. Maybe we'll make a video talking about that at some point. Uh, if there's interest in that, I feel like that could be triggering for some people. I'm not sure. But we, we've we just started harvesting some hens. Most of our hens are in the older stages. They're closer to about six years old. Um, and so we've harvested three of them so far, and we may harvest some more. Um, and Sasha's Oh yeah, Sasha wanted to say we harvested all the roosters um, back maybe about a year or two ago. Um, hold, hold on just one second. <laughs> she, she may come over, but she's whispering off from the sides. Um, but yeah, we, we harvest them as we need them. In fact, we had some risotto tonight and had some chicken with that and... Uh, our cats eat some of the chickens as needed. So that's part of the system here. Um, I see a question. Do you keep meat and egg birds or do you call the egg layers that don't lay for meat? That's a great question. We don't have explicitly uh, birds that are meant for meat production. What we have done, uh, not very much intentionally, just how it's happened is we have taken on hens that folks are getting rid of, so to speak. Maybe it's a Craigslist ad where they say these are hens that are a little old, we're no longer laying, or folks are saying, you know, these are older hens, etc. And we try to give them a nice continued life and then uh, harvest them as we need them for stewing and for slow cooking and that sort of thing. But no explicit meat production. And we're not selling eggs and we're not selling meat. This is for uh, our personal home use and for our friends and family that we care about. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Wow, this is crazy. There's so many questions. What's the best way to, to organize this, I wonder? Um, for those of you that I miss your question, I want to say thank you for offering them, and I'm sorry that I missed them. But I'm going to try to go through here and just catch them as I can and answer them as quickly as I can. Um, one question I'm seeing, how can, uh, when can I allow chickens into my garden space and for how long? Um, thanks, Dustin. We don't move our chickens into new garden spaces to turn beds. So I don't know that I'm equipped to really give a great answer as far as 
uh, how to have them incorporated into production beds. You may have found other videos where we talk about how we incorporate plantings into their yard, and that's worked really nicely. That's all hardy perennial shrubs and the like, and you can look back through the videos about chickens and crops and different things along that line. Um, so we found that in our permanent tenth of an acre front yard chicken space where our chickens stay, we can incorporate crops that support them, uh, but we don't have them moving through other farming spaces. So that's uh, that's for another time, I think. Um, okay, what's your method for sourcing new chicks? Do you breed your own? I think I addressed that a little bit earlier on in that we like the idea of taking on hens that folks are considering less valuable or older and all that. Um, we've found chickens for as low as a dollar or two dollars a hen. We've traded with uh, for plants and we now have 60 plus hens that are from at least 10 different sources. Um, and maybe that's sketchy as far as bringing in animals, but because there's so much living compost, there's so much activity for them. It, we've yet to have a disease issue that has been um, that's carried through the flock or been an issue. So we continue to do that. For next year, we may harvest most of our hens and start new. And tentatively, our plan is to look for hens that are from a factory farming situation and try to give them a better life here. We'll see how that goes. Um, well, a question I'm seeing. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> Quit asking all these questions. Um, have you considered integrating pigs into your system? That would be awesome. I think in our front yard, it's it would be too much. Someday down the road, Sasha and I uh, will probably be at a six acre site up in Trumansburg, New York, and would love to integrate goats and sheep, maybe pigs. We don't eat pork, but we love pigs as beings. And the idea of them turning compost would be amazing, but we're not there yet. It probably, it certainly wouldn't happen in our small tenth of a tenth of an acre front yard. Um, what's, uh, how did you get started? I'm in zone five and how are your chicken doing? Um, how did you get started? I think is a really worthwhile moment to explore that for a second. I think it's with all the videos you've seen um, on this channel, none of the things that we're doing were uh, formally trained or informed. We didn't go to courses on them. We didn't get formal training. We didn't have a definitive design plan initially. And so with the chickens, we knew roughly we wanted to, we knew we wanted to have chickens. We knew we wanted to have eggs. And luckily I had a friend who was experimenting with incorporating compost with his chickens that I got to see that system and that planted the idea that it's viable and valuable as a concept. And so we've been evolving the system over the years. And so that's the thing I wanna convey that felt very important in this session is whatever stage you are in, if you're planting chickens or if you have them and you're thinking about incorporating compost, um, at least our personal experience has been you can try it and iteratively, uh, slow and steady, observe and interact. All the great permaculture principles kind of ease into what that can mean. Um, does your system result in a consistent product that would be sellable? Um, we don't sell compost because we are a permaculture nursery and we're growing a lot of our food. We've designed or we've evolved the system to generate way more compost um, than we generally need, but we're always finding new places to use it. And so what we're selling are the plants that we grow that are fueled by the fertility that this system provides. That's the model that's working really nicely for us. And this way the fertility can stay in our landscape and the plants can move on to new places. Uh, let's see, Chelsea here. If you were to start a new yard, how would you go about it? That's a really great question. Um, I would love to be able to have a system if we had more space where we could have a very safe, very stable coop environment, uh, fencing and the like for uh, hens, but be able to once in a while move the whole system instead of 
bringing in all the compost and bringing it all out. So with the static front yard um, constraints or realities that we're working with, that's the way it's going to be for now. But if we were to design uh, from scratch in the future, the idea of portable fencing, bringing tremendous amounts of wood chips, waste hay, food scraps, sprouting grains, all that, having the chickens work with that, um, and then moving them on and ideally never having them back in that same space, that that kickstarts the beginning of a food forest in that area. That would be ideal. And Jeff Lawton, I think a lot of you would already know of him, uh, amazing permaculture designer in Australia, I believe. Um, he uses that extensively, and that's that's where we would like to go if we could start from scratch. Um, good. I'm glad somebody asked this. Do you get a lot of mice and rats in your compost area? Pretty much every time we put a video out about chicken composting, someone will ask, what about rats? What about mice? Mice and voles are in our experience, a complete non-issue. If a mouse or a vole runs past a chicken, they generally, especially if they're adapted to being outside and working and living and playing outside, that they're not eating pellets, they're eating compost, they attack them, they kill them somewhat humanely, and then they eat them. Um, so they have never been an issue for us. Rats have come once in a while, and we have only experienced them. This is maybe going to be controversial for some people. We've only experienced them as being very thoughtful, very family-oriented, very hardworking beings that actually contribute to the overall health of the composting system. Their behavior tends to be to burrow down into the compost, and maybe they're looking for worms, or maybe they're looking for food scraps that the chickens can't harvest. And when they've been around, they've benefited the compost by aerating it. It's our own personal experience. You do what you want with it. But I would really hope that that experience can at least inform your decisions. I would hope none of you come away from this thinking that you would want to or need to poison or trap rats. Find other ways to exclude them if that's what you need to do. But they're amazing beings. Somebody kicked in five bucks. I missed who that was. But thank you very much for doing that as a side note. Um, Hey, Mark. <laughs> Mark Angelini. I'm so glad he's here. I want to say thank you, Mark, for you're the person who inspired us to go this route in the first place. I had the pleasure of visiting my dear friend Mark Angelini out in Michigan, maybe it was six or seven years ago now, and I got to see the chicken operation that he was operating in his family's backyard. And it was beautiful and wonderful and lots of great compost coming out of it. So, Mark, you're the reason we started doing this. So I'm glad you're here. Um, let's see. We have one hen that is older and stopped laying. She will die of old age. That is a statement, not a question. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I probably will skip. There are questions that are important and nice. We have more bare root trees available in the spring. We, we're not going to update our inventory for the spring, but we'll have tons and tons for the fall. But I think moving forward, I'm going to only try to answer com, um, chicken compost related questions for now. But thank you so much for your interest and your patience. Um, how do you jumpstart a new compost in winter? That's a great question. Uh, it really depends on what is your winter. If you're in northern Canada and it's negative 15 Fahrenheit or negative 10 centigrade, that's not the conversion, but you get the idea. Um, you're probably very hard pressed to be in a composting system right now. But if you have organic matter that's not completely frozen, um, bulking the material, insulating from the sides with either hay bales or wood chips and uh, urine is an incredible um, initiator of compost or a fuel for compost. Um, you could also take old compost, soak it in warm water for a day or two indoors, and then pour it over to help inoculate. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, how do you deal with rabbits? Anything other than a physical barrier? We have not had to deal with them. They come and they eat some things in the winter, and predators tend to eat them as needed. Um, and it seems to work out. So we don't have to deal with them other than try to grow more plants. That's about it. Um, and again, if I'm missing some of your questions, I hope you understand. I'm just seeing you've 
you all can see what's happening. It's kind of flying by. Um, do you get eggs in the winter? Yes, but pretty minimal. Uh, for those of you following closely, you'll know that um, our 60-ish hens are ranging between four and six years old. And so our egg production is down to, I think today we got two eggs. Uh, sometimes we get five or six eggs. It's enough generally for us to eat eggs, but certainly not to give to family and friends right now. Um, we'll get back up to 15 or 20 eggs a day from that flock, but we'll probably harvest most and renew so we can get back up to 30 or 40, 30 eggs a day that we can then share extensively with people or barter. Uh, but thank you for that question. Let's see, so excited. Do, 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 do. Oh, so many familiar names. I really, this it, it feels so amazing to be part of this community. I just wanna not blab on about that, but um, growing this video channel and putting the videos out has been rewarding and then seeing the consistency of folks coming through to check out the videos and to comment and ask questions and offer ideas. It really feels like we're part of something um, big and real and not just virtual. So thank you all so much. Um, good question here. How much time do you spend on maintenance and daily chores with the system? Important question. Uh, the way we are doing the things we're doing, it is not um, a trivial amount of interaction physically. I would say average each day is 15 minutes to a half hour of good sturdy compost turning and you know touching the system moving some compost flipping this moving that over here once a week every other week let's say twice maybe three times a month there's a real heavy push an hour maybe two hours where we're moving a bulk of compost from one area to another or bringing in 10 yards of bulking material or what have you I think if there are more many people involved, you could barely feel the labor of it. Two people or one person um, with the 60 hens we have and the scale that we're operating, which is definitely home scale, but getting bigger-ish than home scale, um, it's, it's definitely a solid chore for each day. I love turning compost. I love the joy the chickens get from it. I love to see how it's evolving and see all that fertility. And I always have. So for me, it's a pleasurable activity. It's good exercise in the winter, uh, but it's something to consider if you're starting this from scratch. When do you add grain to your compost? Are you using organic grains or stuff from the feed stores? Uh, good question. Thank you. Um, we soak in the winter in particular, we take a five gallon bucket and we put in some grain pretty much every day. Maybe we fill it halfway. We like the idea of it being hundred percent organic if we can, but the reality is we get a lot of, um, whole seed from our local organic, wonderful friends, um, that is viable seed. It's both wheat and corn and also weed seeds. It's a blow off from their uh, flour milling operation. And then we are buying sometimes uh, millet and sunflower, which is standard conventional, and hoping that by soaking, sprouting, and incorporating it to all this organic matter, it works out in a good way. Uh, but that's pretty much every day in the winter. If we had more compost coming in, I think we could use less grain. So it kind of scales back and forth. Um, Will you let some hens become fertilized to grow your flock uh, or will you stick strictly to new adults? We would love this kind of a bigger issue is around the uh, question or issue around having roosters. We had roosters. Most of you who watch the channel know that at different points we did have roosters. Um, that was the only time we've had really direct concerns or conflict or issues with neighbors is around the crowing of our roosters. We're still in a suburban-ish place here. And so we thought the we don't want to harvest the roosters. We don't want to kill them, but we also don't want lots of conflict with neighbors. So we harvested them. And so we just have hens now. So there isn't the option to, I was going to say inoculate, <laughs> just think about mushrooms and things, uh, to impregnate them or have them raise their own young. We'd love to do that in the future. Uh, do you compost black walnut leaves? Yeah, black walnut's fine. I, personally, I've found with enough carbon and enough material, enough diversity of it, there have been very few things that we find where it's like, oh, we can't do, you shouldn't put in pine or you can't put in ash. It, 
it's just all fine, it seems, as long as there's enough of it and you're kind of watching. If uh, the hens are very intelligent about what they're interested in, if they don't think it's good for them, they don't interact with it much. And if there's lots of diversity, they'll keep exploring till they find what they need. Um, and earthworms seem to love black walnut material over time. Personal experience, take it for what it's worth. Um, let's see. Will we see more of Sasha this year? Thank you for that question. Is it James Wall? No, it's not James Wall, but maybe he's here. <laughs> it's magic and mundane. Will we see more of Sasha? We don't know. We'll have to see. She remains an enigma for the moment. But we'll, we're hoping to do some videos about uh, her amazing sourdough bread skills, more amazing cooking things. We'll see. It's a matter of getting more comfortable in front of the camera. Um, but thank you for your interest. Have you ever had any problems with the chickens getting out, or do they stay interested in the areas where you intend them to be? Once in a blue moon, they'll sneak out the gate and poke around and we can shuffle them back in. I think we, I think there's enough diversity of fun things to do. There's enough activities in there that they stay pretty content. Um, so we've been lucky that way. We don't clip their wings. I think I tried that once way back when with one hen and it's, it was unnecessary and weird. So I never do that again. Um, how much of the perennial, uh, how much of the chicken's food is covered by perennial plants? planted in the coop during the summer, it's, they eat some of it, you know, like they definitely eat a lot of elderberries, lots of the currants, that kind of thing, but it's not a huge and significant part of their diet. It's, uh, provides shade. It provides uh, varying context. It provides protection, but it's not a huge part of their diet. It could be, but that's not where we've gotten them yet. Um, do you do any type of worming and how do you handle that? Um, we never once have ever given our chickens any chemicals, no worming, no antibiotics, any of that kind of stuff. We've never, I don't think we've given ourselves that forever either, or for a very long time. Um, they seem to be healthy, knock on wood. Um, I think it's just lots of diversity, fresh water, air, things to do every day, lots of reasons to get up and be alive, lots of hard work to do, lots of play, lots of places to relax. They are healthy. Luckily, um, yeah. Have you had any disease issues with your flock? There you go. We've had one or two get sick. Was it old age? Was it that they came in with it? We don't know, but it's never run through the flock as an issue. We could also not be observant and be missing something. I don't want to discount that, but so far it feels like our hens have been healthy. This system fundamentally feels like it's functional and good for their overall life. Um, um, doo -doo -doo. Pardon me as I read. Um, what are chickens most and least preferential for on a typical American lawn? Thank you for the question. I'm not equipped to answer that. Somebody else sees that question from Philip Peter. Maybe you have chickens that browse on pasture. We'd love to have that someday. Maybe you can address that. Um, doo -doo -doo. All right. How do you go about obtaining those sources? Where do you recommend others start? Thank you. Oh, I should say the whole. Hello, you use a lot of external waste systems like food scraps. This is from Highland Hedgehog Homestead. Uh, where do you recommend others start? We made a video a ways back, um, free food for chickens. If you search on the videos, you'll find it. Uh, and that's worth reviewing. I think there's also a lot of comments in there where folks chimed in. We um, talk with people. We talk to local restaurants. If there's a new, there's like a new nice organic local centric uh, food shop that opened up nearby. So we talked with those owners and they were thrilled to set aside compost for us. Um, the worst thing that could happen is you go in in a polite and friendly way, ask, is it possible to collect food scraps? And they say, no, I mean, maybe way worse things could happen, but that seems like the likely worst thing. Most people like the idea. If you tell them what you're doing, uh, they like the saved labor they like to support something like that. That's been our experience, and I would hope that's the same for you. But you won't know unless you pop in and ask. Uh, maybe you need to trade. Maybe there's some other exchange. But for the most part, just, hey, what are you doing with that compost has worked pretty well for us. Um, and if other people have recommendations, please chime in and offer that. Uh, do you avoid adding citrus rinds to the compost piles? Um, 
you know, if, if we get a, a compost bucket that's completely filled with coffee grinds or has tons of lemon rinds or all onion peels, we'll dump that into a compost ring or we can put it in a composting system that's entirely outside of the chicken yard. So when it's easy to sort it out, we do so, but we don't go out of our way. We're not going into a bucket and picking out every last piece of citrus because they can't possibly touch it. It's just, if it's a clear delineation, we do that. And in fact, the recent relationship we built with the place where we're getting compost, they were dumping compost um, coffee grinds into their five gallon bucket. And we said, hey, would you mind doing that? And they said, or mind setting it aside. And they said, we'd be happy to they, they had it aside anyway, and then they just mixed it in. So it was easier for them not to mix it. Um, so that's what we do there. Uh, is your flock mainly still Australorps? We started with um, 25, 25 black Australorps back in 2015. And um, we've added so many chick. I, I couldn't tell you what most of the varieties are. We have, we've got white ones and brown ones. There's red ones. There's butterscotch colored ones. There's stripies, bard rock, I think those are. Um, we get them from so many different places that it's hard to know. But it's Australorp, but it's about half of the whole flock, and then a wonderful medley. Um, and I want to mention this as well. Somebody recently said, do you have recommendations of the best breeds for working with compost? And all I can say is that thus far, uh, without tracking it super closely or monitoring or video cameras, it seems like everybody's into it. They all want to work. The, the black Australorp has been reliable. The barred rocks, the white ones, the white leghorns maybe, and some of the red ones, which folks have said are kind of like the mutts of chickens. Sometimes like really mixed breeds become very red. They do very well, but almost every chicken gets involved. Oh my gosh, the questions, the questions. This is fantastic. Thank you all. These are really fun. This is, we've been doing this a half, a little less than a half hour, and there's been a ton of great questions. So amazing. Um, let's see. Uh, if you asked a question before and I completely missed it, feel free to pop it again. That's great if you want to do that. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, am I caught up? Um, I've been, if you'll bear with me, uh, in blabbing at you for the last half hour, it's hard, I hope you can understand, it's kind of hard to like be present with talking and addressing things and monitoring what's going on. So uh, if you see me kind of dropping off for a second, it's because I'm trying to catch up. Um, growing in your chicken yard, if you tried the... Okay, so somebody asked, I watched your, watched your video on caged plants growing in your chicken yard. Have you tried this with squash? We have squash bugs. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, we, I think we've had squash growing in there, but maybe not intentionally, certainly beans and things like that. Uh, I don't see any reason why you couldn't go pretty intensely with annual crop production in a chicken operation, uh, as long as you had enough protective fencing material so that those uh, plants had a chance to go. We've grown corn in there and they did just fine with it. Um, and yeah, it seems like squash could be great. Although I would wonder if they had access enough to the squash leaves to eat the squash bugs, would they also eat the leaves? I wonder. Um, but certainly it's worked for us with beans and with corn. We've had tomato crops growing in there before. So that works out pretty nicely. Um, now, <laughs> Beansy, you're the one that always loves Stanley, I think. You comment about him on every video. There's our friend Stanley, washing in the background. <laughs> um, okay, here's a question. Do you let your chickens into the garden during the winter? Any recommendations for that? Uh, I think I addressed that a little bit earlier on, that you know we don't have our chickens move around. In the future, I would love to have them go into uh, a garden if it's starting to get weedy or it's starting to have issues and um, let them work in there. But for now, we don't do that. Um, random question. When is your birthday? April 15th. Thank you for asking. Um, 1980. 1980, Sasha wanted me to. 
uh, clarify. Would the compost make a good poop cigar? Thanks for that. That's very helpful. Very thoughtful, interesting question. I'm glad you asked. Um, do you, okay, here's a good question. <laughs> do you have any way of taking a day off from tending to your chickens? Chicken sitters, pile of grain in the coop, or is it every day for you guys? It, well, it's every day for us because we did have an automatic door for a while, but it had a couple issues here or there. And so we open the door in the morning, we close it at night. Um, so that's, somebody would need to do that every day. That said, it's good to address this. If there's enough bulk material in the scene overall, there's sprouts that you've added, there's piles of food scraps, there's wood chips, there's old logs, there's this and that. Um, I don't see why you couldn't walk away, basically have someone helping you that brings out soaked grain and puts them on the ground once a day for that system. And for up to a week or so, it probably would work itself out. I think you'd find that all of the composting systems will have gotten very flattened out, pretty capped and anaerobic, uh, and would need a lot of fluffing and opening and piling again. So it's like, this is the ideal place to leave a compost pile to keep chickens active, and that's what they do to it. Um, but they would probably be pretty active for a few days before you had to interact with it again. It's worth testing. And you can see, I think as soon as you start seeing conflict, uh, there's stresses that start to reveal themselves in the flock that are immediately remedied by novelty of opening compost. If you see enough of those stresses, you know you have to get involved. That's been the metric we use. Um, and thank you for asking that. Tax day, yeah. Uh, do, 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 do you have the invasion Asian jumping worms? If so, do your chickens eat those worms too? We Those Asian jumping worms, they come around once in a while. They're insane. They're so fast and wild. It almost feels like they're attacking you. Um, I don't know if I could say explicitly that I've seen chickens eat them, but they've eaten some really big earthworms. So I think they would eat them if they had the chance. Uh, in our zone 5B central New York, there's all these people that are scared of that invasive worm and you know all these things. What I found is it comes it does things, it's kind of wild how fast it burns through compost, and then the winters generally freeze them off. Um, we, we haven't had them be an issue yet. Your birthday's April, well, happy birthday and April 15th to you too. Um, yeah, can you leave your home and are your chickens safe? I think I addressed that. There's a nice fence around the whole space. They're really kept in there. Um, and it is a system that I think would be amenable to having folks chicken sit if that was what you wanted to do. Um, do you have a verma comp is a question. Kind of, very informally, the most recent video about the worms, the red wigglers, I think would address that. So if you wanted to look back through our videos, it's one of the most recent ones and that explains what we're doing there rather than talking about it again. Um, growing pawpaw from seed, that's for another time. I, For what it's worth, if folks really like this format, uh, in the winter months, I'm down for it, like once a week or every other week to just sit for an hour and address questions. And one topic I thought would be really compelling would be to answer any and all questions I can around how we operate our nursery. So save that question for that, and I'll check in with folks about that soon enough. Um, well, big question. What was the deciding factor to start living this way for you two? I feel like that would be a good question for another topic to keep that question and bring it back because it might be nice to spend an hour or so and that's a good question it's a great question well it might come back um is to open that up in a in a format where um where we can get deeper into like the background and our history and where we're going with things so we'll do that um okay could you talk about your perennial layout within the chicken yard? Thank you for that question. Um, and I should be saying folks' names as I see them. So Andrew Allen, and thank you for all of your other, all the other folks that have asked questions. I'm still getting used to this format, so please forgive me. Um, perennial layout, you know, the thing is with permaculture, there's a lot of talk about the importance of design and I get it. I think it's really important to design, but I also feel like I've seen many examples of analysis paralysis as a descriptor where you can get stuck on 
perfecting the design before you do things uh, to the point where you don't do things. And so what I tend to lean into is some basic mantras of design of whatever, we're in the Northern hemisphere. And so I say, whatever is the tallest stuff goes to the northernmost of a given space. So the most light, so if here's the northern end, we've got our southern sun coming in. So along the fence line, we have big poplars, we've got big willows, we've got uh, one step in plums and alders and hazelnuts, one step in, we've got our currants and whatnot, we've got our has caps. So you get the idea, the sun can come in and hit all of those different elements. Um, that's one little simple design lens to kind of remember to be able to look through in a given landscape. Um, but beyond that, it's been experimenting, just trying stuff out. And because we're a nursery, uh, it's not a big deal to say, well, that didn't work. I'm going to dig up that nice, big, beautiful plant and transplant it or sell it or do something else with it. It seems feels like it's never really a loss to have to rearrange a bit. So I wouldn't get stuck on that if that's something you're feeling, not insinuating that you are. Um, okay, have you ever worked with any other animals for composting and gardening? Have you considered goats? We would love goats. I think sheep would be amazing. Someone earlier asked about pigs. They would be fun. Ducks would be great for sealing uh, ponds at our, the larger site that we operate but we do not have direct experience with other animals, just chickens. Um, let's thank you, Prince Pennsylvania Prepper, for encouraging people to give thumbs up. I guess what that helps it grow or something. I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> I should know that better. But anyway, thank you all for watching. Don't feel any obligation to thumbs up anything. Um, okay, when you introduce new chickens, do you add them in the evening? You know, we probably could do things more elegant than we do. We used to think we had to bring them in and give them a day and they go in their own spot. But what we've done the last bunch of times we brought in chickens was uh, dumped a ridiculous amount of food in as many places as possible in the chicken yard, turned a ton of compost, and somewhere in the chaos of all this fun stuff happening, some new chickens snuck in. And for the most part, it kind of worked out. They'd get beat up a little bit and maybe not figure out where to sleep the first night or two, so we'd have to bring them in after dark. But there's enough going on. It's not the scenario of a single resource point. There's not one feeder that all of the flock has to get to. There's food everywhere, so hierarchy tends to dissolve in that scenario. Resource scarcity begets conflict kind of as like a universal rule, it seems. So if you can reduce resource conflict in the flock, you see, it seems like you can re reduce hierarchy and abuse. Um, ever considered doing voiceovers? Thank you for asking, but I have not. And I don't think I will. Fantastic question. Um, how do you deal with spurs? I don't know what spurs are. Oh, spurs as in like they, they kick you? Um, we don't have roosters. Some of our hens have really long, weird, old spurs, but they've never once come at us with them. So we just look at them and hope that they're feeling okay. Um, I live in a dry climate and my piles are too dry. Should I hose them down? If you live in a dry climate, I would hope you're really considering as much rainwater collection as you can possibly do. I have videos on that. There are other great resources. Now's the time. Drier places will be getting drier, and the more water we can store passively that comes down when it does is great. And in that scenario, um, giving the compost some water makes sense on really, really prolonged dry spells, covering the compost may help uh, hold in moisture. We have the exact opposite issue. Our compost generally gets very uh, moist and cooled down but we all have our own uh, scenarios, but I hope you collect water and I wish you the best in a dry climate. Um, okay, what's your mortality rate? I've got nearly 200 chickens and I'm always trying to incorporate your lessons at a little larger scale. Um, thank you for that, Ben. Um, our, our mortality rate, we've had, we had a rooster that had some unknown, un understandable illness as a respiratory illness, but it, I feel like he probably came in with that. Uh, that was big or kind, sir. If you remember that beautiful purple 
or lavender um, Orpington rooster. Anyway, we've had a few hens and a rooster have issues where we had to put them down. We didn't eat them or feed them to our animals. We buried them. Uh, it was maybe four or five in total. And I can't tell you why, that I understand why that happened. Uh, I think they came with it, but maybe that's a lame excuse. I'm not sure. Um, buh, 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 buh. Do you focus on collecting produce waste versus something like restaurant waste? Uh, I worry restaurant waste would be less healthful, but easier to source. Chelsea, that's a good question. Yeah, w when we first started out, there was a local... Um, restaurant that I set up an exchange where I got, um, I was able to get free dinners from this place every month in exchange for picking up their compost. And it was like 25 gallon buckets a week of uh, French fries and nachos and chips and like really salty. So it was an incredible amount of protein, incredible amount of biomass and pretty much not ideal for our hen's health. Um, so you know, getting started with it, I think it all depends on your own personal preference and feeling, but um, thinking through what's the right way to say it? Would you be comfortable eating what it is your sort, you know, if it wasn't a rotten back end of the material, would you go to that restaurant and eat there? Would you go to that store and buy produce from there? And if the answer is a resounding yes, then it's a clear yes. If you're, eh, I'm not sure, then it really is then a question of how much money do you want to save with your composting? How many other sources can you bring in so it's not the only thing you're feeding your creatures? That's a subjective question and one that I'd encourage you to really think about. And you can explore and feel and see how they respond to. Uh, and I wish you luck in figuring that one out. Yeah. Um... Okay, a question. Would you suggest using a maggot bucket as a protein source for your chickens? Sure, it's summer months. Uh, you know, our cold climate, house flies are really almost non existent six months out of the year. So it's not a reliable year round source for us. But I've seen examples people putting in roadkill and things like that suspended, um, putting in meat sources, and maybe there's a local. Uh, dairy or somebody with a homestead that has excess milk. There's a lot of amazing protein sources and we can get into that if folks have interest. Um, but we find that passively in the summer months, once in a while, house flies will be attracted to some element in the compost and we'll call them fly larva, will evolve and the chickens love them. So it's a really worthwhile uh, thing to allow to happen and facilitate and manage. Um, do you... Um, okay, bear with me again. I'm getting caught up here. Frank asks, do you incorporate dusting zones for your flock? Good question. In the summer, it seems like a non-issue. There's space under the coop. They get under there. They take care of themselves. It's awesome. Uh, and, and it's interesting you asked that because just today, I was working on rebuilding a hardwood propagation thing, which I'll be documenting soon in videos. Um, and I had leftover coarse sand. So I put a, a nice tray, a nice deep trough filled with 50 pounds of sand and diatomaceous earth that they can work with. Um, they seem okay, but it probably would be nice to be more reliable with that. Uh, do you have an idea of how much cash you're saving by making your own compost versus buying it? David, that's a good question. Whew, man, I really don't know. How much does it cost for a yard of compost? That's the thing. Um, I'm, I'm a person who, and both Sasha and I are this way, that when there's a chance to do harder work so that we can do the thing ourselves instead of buying it, that's where we almost always go. And I've been generating compost through waste streams for 15 years now, so I really don't even know. Um, but you can look it up, I guess, is... Uh, how much does a yard of good quality organic compost cost where you live? Um, our system, I think, would generate, gosh, I don't even know. Uh, I should skip that one. But there's mountains of compost, uh, and it's lots of labor, but we don't have to pay for any of it. And so it feels very worthwhile to me. The trick with all this, and I think any of you that do agricultural ventures where you're earning, so we earn our entire living 
by being a nursery and in part by doing these YouTube videos, but the nursery is really our, our bread and butter. It's the core of our income. If you ever let yourself as a farm or an agricultural enterprise calculate all the hours you spend focused on the work you do and think about what you earn as a dollar per hour, it can be psychologically crushing. So I don't do that. And so then I'd say it's amazing and great. Um, but it's, yeah, I'd like to turn the compost. We love our chickens. We love the system. It feels good. It feels ethical. It feels rewarding. And so then it's it's easier to navigate it than to say, well, I could be buying it for $20 a yard, but I'm spending eight hours to generate it, you know, whatever that is. I hope that answers more than just that question, maybe. Uh, so Matt is saying $40 a yard in central Massachusetts. Um, in the summer months, I'm seeing... I think we get 20 wheelbarrow loads of compost per week out of the system. I don't know how many yards fit in a wheelbarrow uh, or how many wheelbarrows it takes to move a yard, I should say. Um, but I would guess we're, we're generating many, many, many yards of compost per month uh, as a waste product in feeding our hens. So that feels pretty resilient overall. Um, uh, okay, 10K subs, no videos. Interesting. Why are cities banning chickens? Man, I wish, or a woman, person, I wish I could answer that. I have no idea. It's ridiculous. Wherever you are, I hope you are doing the good work of trying to push for people to have agency and self-reliance and interdependence in our communities and um, raise chickens where you live and fight for it. We, we're coming into a time where we all need to be uh, either raising more food where we live, consuming less from elsewhere, or supporting others around us that are doing it. And so it's important that we all feel empowered to, to do that and support others. So maybe you live in a city that doesn't allow it, uh, and there are people in your city or your town that are fighting to try to make it happen. Connect with them. How can you support them? How can you get involved? That's a really good question. Um, Pat Duffin asks, how is the smell from your compost setup? Does it get in the house in the summer? It smells like whispers and roses all day, every day. Uh, no, in the winter, there's nothing. There's like just about no smell. In the summer, once in a while, it can be pungent. But as a baseline, if we are managing the system actively, every day we're going out and we're turning compost, we're making sure we're keeping up with the amount of carbon that we should have. In other words, we're doing it right there's almost never any smell. 90 degrees and a heavy rain, and then it's sunny afterwards, there's a little bit of a smell. Uh, but the that just signals that immediately the next thing to do is turn the pile, get air into it, and add more carbon. And it's amazing how fast that can absorb the smell and get it back to a healthy state. Healthy composting systems should not have unpleasant odors. That's just the way it is there. Um, Norman suggests we're making two to three yards a week by his calculations. That could very well be. Yeah, maybe. And this, I think that's at peak. I don't think I would say that that's every day. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Have you had success bartering bags of compost, says Al Doust? If so, can you offer an example? Um, we haven't really tried to leverage compost or that fertility as um as something to ascribe value or extract value from but because we're a nursery and we also pot up plants for local sales we take the high value perennial plants we grow that we ship as bare root those that are left over we take pots that we find from waste streams like nurseries going out of business what have you and we make our own potting mix and you can find videos on our channel that talk about that and part of that potting mix is the compost is coming from the chicken system so that fuels the growth of the plants that are then part of our income if that makes sense but we've given away compost uh, we've offered it to people we've helped to make raised beds where we capped it with our compost but we haven't um, monetized our compost yet. I don't think we'll, we'll try to avoid it if we can. Uh, tips for starting compost in the winter. I think I addressed that a bit. Um, but yeah, basically the colder your the colder, let's say it this way, the colder the places you live, the larger the volume of material you need 
with as much loose bulking insulative material around it as you can get away with. Because everyone lives in different spots. I think you're in Alberta, Canada, then I'm, you, you got to wait till June to get cracking on that, I think. Um, Kevin Nelson asks, how old are you? Does anyone want to guess? I'll, I'll give it a minute and you can guess and then I'll say. Um, so a question about the plants. I'd love to come back to that, but I, okay. Um, yeah, so Eli Johnson writes, the big fear I saw against chickens in a city near me was disease. They worried feces would wash into people's yards. I'm sure that that's an argument in places. They're worried about the sound and all that. This is where I think it's important to really fight for the right to have food interdependence where we live. If it's okay to drive diesel trucks or if it's legal to use Roundup on people's yards, and there's all the insane things that are happening in city spaces. If that's all legal, then chicken should be legal. Fight for it. I hope it works for you. However, we can support, let us know. Um, but anyway, yeah, the website and stock, that would be, I'm afraid it's going to be for fall. And we look forward to growing a lot more. And thank you for your patience. If you're looking for great plants and you would hope to get them from our website, but you can't find them, um, we've got videos on that list other great nurseries. And that might be worth your while to check out some other permaculture nurseries that are out there. Um, <laughs> here come all the numbers. Oh man, people are pretty spot on. Yeah, I'm, I'm 39. There you go. So there we go. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Ooh, Chelsea. The question, do you have a favorite hay fork for turning compost? Thank you. Awesome question. Uh, it seems like I shouldn't be that excited about this, but tools feel so important if you're going to work with them all the time. My absolute favorite hay fork for turning compost is um, specifically a five-tine fork and one that has a good sturdy handle but not a burly handle. So normally, therefore... Um, moving hay or for bulk material mo moving. And so I don't wail on it. I don't use it to pry and break into material. I'm careful with it. But that lighter tool with a little bit of wideness between the metal tines makes for amazing uh, moving of, of the average sort of compost we have. But strong suggestion would be a straight handled five or six tine hay fork slash manure fork that's on the lighter side and you might find them at local yard sales for, you know, $5 a piece or maybe just the head of one. Then you can have yourself or someone else help you build the handle. Um, but 30 or 40 bucks at a hardware store, well worth it. Please don't use a, a standard garden shovel or a rake or that, like, well, use whatever you have. <laughs> but if you can get access to a five or six tine hay fork, it's amazing. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, Jamie Carr asks, how can I incorporate pig manure into my compost? Um, you can, this is kind of a general response to that. Any given input, if you want to be careful and thoughtful and accurate from the get-go, it might be worth your while, five, ten minutes. Look up all the different feed sources for compost. What is the carbon to nitrogen ratio? And your ultimate goal is roughly a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 30 to 1-ish. Manures are way on the nitrogen-rich end. So if you're going to add pig manure, uh, chicken manure, how, you know, horse manure, what have you, make sure from the outset you're adding lots of bulk loose carbon. Sawdust, wood chips, uh, leaves from local bags and things like that have been the ideal that we've worked with, they're generally free or very cheap. I hope that's helpful. I think I also want to mention on the flip side of that, don't get stuck on, oh my God, it's 42 to one. Just put the stuff in. And then if it smells, add more carbon and turn it more often. And if it stalls out and doesn't really do anything, add more nutrient rich stuff, add more seeds to sprout, add more moisture, maybe urine if it really stalls out or food scraps. And that's about the, the extent of the recipe that I work with. Um, ba -bum -bum -bum. Um, tch -tch -tch. 
Okay, so uh, Tammy St. Clair asks, have you tried using a pickaxe to turn soil? Turning soil, for sure, that makes sense. For working with um, our compost and turning it, the, the five tine works great. Uh, Sacred Circle Homestead, hey folks, I know you guys. Uh, Razorback makes a great five tine fork. Yeah, I think that might be the one I have. It has a little rubber handle on the end, which makes it comfortable. Um, you'll, you'll all find the one that works for you. And really, if you have Craigslist, I think in Canada, is it Kijiji? I don't even know. I'm not up there. But uh, for us, we've got farm and garden. Wherever you live, there might be a farm and garden section. See if anyone's selling old tools. Are there farm auctions? Are there old yard sales at a old farm? That's a great way to get a bunch of tools that are awesome and old and amazing and don't cost a ton of money. Um, ba -ba -ba. Okay, give me a moment. Let me get caught up again here. Um, someone's mentioning the raccoons and badgers are another issue. Um, I don't know if Sasha will want to speak. Maybe not this evening. Yeah, let's see if we can get Sasha to come talk for a second. No one's explicitly asked about predators yet, but I think, well, it's they're talking about like raccoons and other things. I, I think it's, I, I think it's important to get Sasha's take on this because it's really special and really thoughtful. Would you mind? She's a little nervous, but don't, but don't, or be nervous. Come on over just for a second, at least say hello. <laughs> I hope folks get that when she's not in videos, it's not because we don't, there's Sasha. <laughs> um, no, come on. It's it's. I think it's really special. The i the idea of. So we had. I'll call the chair. We yeah. Come on over with the chair. We had raccoons come. We had an opossum come early on, and, um, my first reaction when we had an opossum is, oh, we got to kill them because they're bad and this and that. And Sasha's take on it, I think, was really beautiful, and it's worked really, really well. So, mate, would you? And if you don't want to share, you don't have to. But I just want folks to hear your <laughs> ideas on it. Um, <laughs> hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know how far this really goes. But in my mind, I feel like if I care about all the creatures, not just the chickens, as important beings in the world of their own, then feels like maybe that intention actually goes somewhere that they feel like they're not, it's not a combative relationship and I leave food for them <laughs> in the night yeah. and they do eat that food. Like at our grocery store, um, we can get blackened bananas for like a dollar for a big bag and they really love, um, they love those bananas to the point that there were a couple of times that chickens sat out the night um, sitting on eggs and the raccoons and I'm sorry, I, I'm not good at talking. No, it's, thing. Hey, and it's, <laughs> the raccoons and the opossums um, ate, ate the bananas and, and not the chickens. Yeah. The chickens came through. We, the next day the chickens were there sitting on their eggs. The raccoons had come and and it's so sweet because not only did they come and eat the bananas, but they peel the bananas. Well, some of some yeah. sometimes we'll eat and we will leave eggs in the summer months when there's an overabundance or there's an abundance of eggs. We leave them as offerings and they crack them and drink the juice up. And we set up a game cam and it looked like they brought their kids once in a while. So it was like a family unit that came and I think there's also something about like if you're in sort of a desert as far as good food goes and you have a chicken coop then they maybe they try to get in but it's a lot of work to get into a coop and kill a chicken and abscond with a chicken and risk angering humans that tend to get angry at you so they probably want to avoid that if they can and if if you can afford to buy them some dollar bananas for a big bag of black bananas and then they'll have a good time on that. No. <laughs> it's it's a the thing I love about it is it's a sweet sentiment and it's, you can say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's nice to think of animals and, you know, love all the animals and treat them well. And that's all well and good, but we're trying to run a farm. But the reality is 
that sentiment and that approach has translated so into... So far it's worked, yeah. Yeah, we've had That's no... Fun. We've had raccoons and opossums come. We haven't had any chickens be killed by them. And so thank you for... You hang. Do you want to hang out for the rest of this? Even with my big zip. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, she's gone at the one hour mark. Um, thank you for doing that, though. I think that's a really important perspective. And I, yeah, anyway, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> so we're at an hour. I don't know how long do we do this? Should we do this for a little longer? Ooh, another like 15 minutes sound good? I don't know. How, how long are you supposed to do it? What's the thing? Um, let's see. Um, but, um, okay. Fables Moonshine asked any plans in integrating more animals on the farm? I addressed that our little half acre spot where we live now, where lots of our videos come from, it just won't work. Someday the six acre spot where we document the larger scale experiments, which is uh, up in Trumansburg, New York, definitely. And we'll share every step of the way with you wonderful folks in our community. Um, let's see. I want Sasha to reread when this is over all the lovely comments. So many people said lovely things to you, and it's good. She's a wonder, that Sasha, I'll say. Um, let's see. How much food do you source on your farm? Um, good question. In the summer months, a lot. Most, most meals, every meal has most of the food from what we grow, uh, our eggs. Um, obviously, and then lots of greens and things. We grow potatoes and garlic that we enjoy in the winter, but we also barter with a lot of folks locally for um, really high value crops for us and for meat and for milk and things like that. So between what we grow directly and then what we grow that we can uh, swirl through our community in exchange for other things that we need, it's, it's the majority of our diet at this point, for sure. Um, Doo -doo -doo. Whoa, Fallout Farms, thank you. That is a lovely thing. You didn't have to do that, but I'm not upset that you did. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, Pennsylvania Prepper says, Sasha should be in the video. Her personality shines, I agree. And I think as time goes on, she's gonna be in more and more videos as she feels comfortable to be. It's not her number one thing to do, but uh, if you all could only hear the, amazing thoughts she offers every day. You'll, you'll see why I'm hoping she gets into be, to be in more videos. Um, all right, any other questions? Am I caught up? Uh, I guess what I would say right now, for those of you that have patiently asked a question before but I missed it, and we didn't cover it, if you've been watching and you feel like it still hasn't been covered, feel free to bring it up again. I won't be upset. I'm, I'm sure I missed, there's so many amazing comments in here. I just missed a bunch and that is what it is. Um, let's see, David Simpson asked, did you dismantle the dog water heater and put the element under your chicken water? Um, yeah, I, I should do an update video on this. We just um, got from Tractor Supply, kind of junky place to get stuff, but whatever, it's, they had it there. Um, it was $20 for a water that was very easy to modify, and I put a little temp probe thing next to it, and that's been keeping the water completely thawed all winter. I'll, I'll share some videos on that, or a video. No need for more than one. Um, boo -boo -boo, Georgia boy. Do you have any advice for people who live in hot, humid, insect-dense areas? I love you guys. Y'all got me back in this game. I had given up on gardening. Oh, oops, question at the end there. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, hot and humid, you can grow all year round. I always feel, it feels like trees are, it's not, they're not the only answer, but if you live in a place that's very hot, Growing, fast growing trees that can provide you shade and shelter and protection is not a bad idea. I think wherever we all live, planting more diverse, dense food and medicine centric, long lived perennial plants is critical for the earth. So I would hope you are all doing that. And I look forward to hearing from all of you on doing that too. Um, uh, any tips? 
JKS Homestead, any tips on storing fall leaves in a small space? Yeah, anytime you need to store bulk material and you have very limited square footage, you can consider a uh, standard thing you find in plans online all the time, screw together three pallets that keeps material held together. You could also take two by four welded wire fencing or old fencing that you find for free somewhere and make rings out of it. Uh, and that will let you go three feet high or four feet high with uh, light bulk material without having it spread and fall apart. Hope that's helpful. Um, Stone Emperor, what perennials would you suggest to grow in a chicken yard? Um, real winners as far as helping the chickens out. Elderberry and currants, really easy. Stick cuttings in the ground, put some stones around them in a cage. Uh, and then as the fruit drops, the chickens love them. That's That's been wonderful. Um, we have uh, hazelnuts in there, but the chipmunks take every hazelnut before they come to fruition. I don't know that they're necessarily great food for the chickens either, but raspberries, blackberry, the thornless blackberries have been amazing. Um, and then it's a question of what crops are, do you want to grow that are explicitly for the chickens? What do you want to grow for you? Um, I think that the sky's the limit really. Um, Bill Higgins asks how many dozen eggs you get per day. I think I mentioned before, in the winter, pretty lean. Just enough for us to eat. We have old hens. What are you going to do? In the summer, um, we generally have like up to nine to ten dozen eggs at any given time sitting in our garage that we're trying to find homes for uh, because, again, we're not selling them. So um, anywhere from three eggs a day to 20 to 25. Um, Marion... Pumper, does composting differ when you live in a tropical climate? Um, I would suspect that the answer is yes. Uh, you can do it all year round, and there might be other considerations, but I don't have any firsthand experience, so I'm not going to suggest that I know. Um, uh, Lord Stoddy, Dodi, do you have any groundhogs in your area? Um, do you or Sasha have any advice to make buddies out of them? That's a nice idea. We haven't had groundhogs at our... Uh, yeah, we did. We had a groundhog all last summer. Oh, yeah, we had groundhogs in the garden, but they weren't that bad. They ate a ton of stuff. They ate a bunch of stuff. I forget. Just, we just keep planting more stuff. I don't know what to say. Uh, we haven't had any groundhog as issue or predators or challenges in the chicken-specific area. Just the um, fennel. Yeah, they ate all the fennel. And then the fennel came back. <laughs> and then the fennel came back. So what are you going to do? Um, whenever it's possible, it seems like the universal answer to these things is grow more of all the things. I've, uh, up to the limit, I've, people have limited time. They have limited physical ability. They have limited finances. And I get that. I'm not trying to push that. But up to the limit of where you're comfortable, whenever possible, planting more seems to always be good. At least that's what I think. Um, do -do -do -do. Let's see. Um, Highland Hedgehog Homestead. Mention a great suggestion here that I oh, appreciate it, but that might I suggest tag teaming it and having Sasha read the questions and then both of us answer them. That's a, a good suggestion. If we do, well, when we do another live video uh, that includes oh, more of our background, Sasha will not just talk off on the distance, <laughs> um, but actually be in the video and we'll, we'll do some back and forth. Um, maybe we're gonna wind it down here. We got a good hour in. Let's say another five, 10 minutes. Any last burning questions that are chicken specific? And boy, different folks are, I guess, what is this? You can put money or something. Thank you for that. Wow. Um, let's see, Adventure Hawks. Hello again, nice to see you. Um, yeah, have you considered raising other birds like ducks, geese, or turkeys? I love the idea of it. We have wild turkeys at our other property, um, and ducks would be amazing. But chick I think it's just going to be chickens for now where we are until we have more space. Portillo family. It's super chat. Yeah, I YouTube mentioned that, and I hadn't really dug too deep into it. You can tell I'm super pro on this stuff. I've been making videos for 10 years now, and basically just using whatever old iPhone um, I can get a hold of. But um, 
Oh, let's see. Kelly Lee, orientation of the winter compost run high tunnel. Great question. I would offer up that all things being equal, if you can just plop it down in any orientation, perpendicular to the most dominant direction that your heavy winter winds come from would be ideal. So let me explain what I mean. Maybe it just makes sense, but ours happens to run north-south, but that's because our coop runs north-south and the constraints of the space put it right in there. It's also compatible with the fact that most of our winter winds come from the west. And so the wind hits the tunnel and bounces over it rather than going through the open doors and pulling all the heat out. So if it can be any which way perpendicular to your heavy wind seems like the most conservation of warmth. Um, but um, uh, Al Johnson, you had asked, uh, focus on dual use breeds or layers. And I think for those of you coming in later, it's worth noting it again. We don't have a particular drive on has to be layer, has to be meat. We'll take whatever hens need to find a home and give them the best life that we can give them and whatever eggs they want to provide is great. And then if and when it's time to harvest them, we appreciate whatever size they are. They're amazing. They had a great life. Um, uh, Michelle, Helen, what time of the year is your web store stocked up? Boy, we got to do a video about that at some point. Um, just to touch on it really briefly, we updated at the end of December. We were sold out on a lot of things by the first week of January. You folks are amazing. It's crazy what the demand is for these plants, and we're scrambling to keep up with it. But it's just the two of us and our weird, crazy gardens everywhere. So um, it just is what it is. Uh, problems with rats and mice. Thanks for asking. Go back towards the beginning of the video. They eat the mice and we love the rats. Oh, this is the quick synopsis. Um, doo -doo -doo. One thing that I would mention too, and maybe you already are all doing this, is that for those of you that are reading other folks' comments, and I hope you all are uh, checking that out, a lot of you are doing this too. And maybe you want to check out each other's video channels. Maybe you want to reach out to each other and exchange notes and ideas. Uh, I think an important part of good community is to reduce hierarchy. And, uh, you know, here I am in this position because I've, I put these videos out and we're doing this system and sharing, but I bet all of you together are going to have way more interesting ideas than anything I could be blabbing about. So I hope you are all taking this as a chance to like, chat with each other, share notes, maybe connect and, um, and learn from each other too. Bear with me, just catching up again. Um, oh, somebody just mentioned, yes, indeed. Subscribe to a couple people on this chat already. Highland Hedgehog Homestead. Yeah, it's awesome. It's, um, it's, Pretty amazing the way we put out the the request for folks to share their own uh, YouTube channels. I got I got a chance to subscribe to a bunch of channels at YouTube in a million years wouldn't have shown me. Uh, so I'm really great, <laughs> really grateful for that. Is what I was trying to say. Um, cool, Mitch. Thank you for that. How do you keep your positivity and spirits high when undertaking this sort of project? Man, really important question. This kind of stuff, it, there's so many ways to feel beat down by it. things that don't work or this breaks or that didn't, you know. Um, I think if you, if you can wrap around the basic premise of what you're doing, chicken composting, small scale nursery, raising more food, that part of it is not just about doing that thing, but part of it is about how it can feel to be outside, how it can feel to be under the clouds, how it feels to challenge yourself and to breathe deeply. How much can you do today? Can you do a little more tomorrow? If all of that is part of what's driving you, then the millions of weird things that happen and crushing disappointments that happen uh, are informative and helpful, but you're on a path. It sounds like a cheesy thing to say, but um, more things haven't worked that I've tried than have worked by volume, but I'm focusing on the things that are working and going in that direction. And uh, I hope that is how you feel. 
or I hope you can feel that way if you don't. Um, and I think it's also important to talk with other people that are trying these things. Man, this really didn't work that I tried. Oh, well, I tried that and now I'm trying this. And um, if I made videos of all of the things that are happening, not just the things that we're working on that feel promising, it would be millions of hours and most of it would feel depressing. <laughs> so kind of focus on what's working and keep going that direction. But thank you for that. Um, okay, let's... How do you how do you say when we're done? I don't know. Let's say that we're we're wrapping up here. So um, I think I'm gonna wind it down for this evening. Where I want to leave it for now is um, you know we'll keep putting these videos out about the chickens. Let's have more and more dialogue uh, in the comments on future videos. Maybe you all can talk with each other. You can find um, you can find me through. The, it's edibleacres.org is our website. It's easy to contact us through there. And I'm happy if people have specific questions that pop up that are really holding them back and they're, they're not, they don't feel like they have a community around them that can answer, email me. And maybe Sasha, maybe I will email you back or we can chat on the phone and try to help you out. Uh, it feels important to get folks into this stuff. It's really meaningful. Um, and thank you all for being part of this this evening. We'll keep it super informal sometime in the next week or so. I'll make a note that we're going to do another live video and we'll try to do something about, uh, maybe I'll do like a poll and see what people are most interested in. Um, thank you all and we will see you soon. I guess that's it. I'm just going to, do I hang up? I just probably hit the X. Ta-da! Toodaloo! Goodbye! Thank you all.